Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Charles Overby, chairman of the Overby Center for Southern Journalism and Politics, and I'm so glad you could join us tonight. This is another in our series of fall programs at the Overby Center, and as you know, we like to do things to promote the First Amendment. But another thing that we like to do, and we're doing it, as, I think, in a special way this fall, is to celebrate uh, excellence of people who have gone to Ole Miss. And uh, we did that with our most recent program with Curtis Wilkie. He's here tonight. We did it, uh, the, program, the very first program of the fall, with Don Cole and Larry Martindale. Don's here tonight. Thank you, Don. Uh, is that's kind of personal excellence that really, I think, sets Ole Miss apart. And I'm so glad that the Overby Center can uh, help celebrate and uh, focus attention on the people who have done just legendary things in their careers. And tonight is uh, the ultimate legend at Ole Miss, Robert Kayot. Uh You know, we, the, thank you. There'll never be another Robert Kayak. Well, let's hope not. <laughs> it's just hard to imagine how uh, your life and Ole Miss has been so interlinked and in such an outstanding way. And Robert has written this book, 60, to recount uh, one year, uh, just one year in his many years of excellence, and how many different uh, things happened and how they tied together in his life and the life of Ole Miss and football. It's a great sports book. It's a great book on politics. Uh, and uh, we're fortunate to have a person who helped shape this book with Robert, Neil White's here. And Neil, you did a great job uh, in editing and publishing this book. Neil was the editor and publisher of Robert's first book. And I think uh, that's a great thing uh, as an aspiring author myself. I am running out of time. <laughs> but uh, uh, to be able to say your first book, meaning you already have a, another book and it going. So, Robert, I want to ask you, after uh, having written such a good first book, which was a memoir and a, uh, a guide for educators on how to, uh, how to do things, the education of R Robert Kayot, why, why did you write this book? <laughs> I, was re I was reading uh, Amy Grant's uh, book today and she talks about why she wrote that book and she she has a, a number of poems in it some little short pieces and some songs and she says in the book something like I was trying to find out who I am when I wrote that book and I was and she writes a poem about that that's not nearly as uh, articulate as she makes it but that's what she said uh, before I answer that question I will answer the question I'll try I want to say something first. Uh, thank you for coming. I think it's wonderful that you all would come out at 5.30 <coughs> in the afternoon uh, for this program. And it's a credit to you and to Ole Miss and to us. Second thing I'd like to say is that this lady on the front row, Ms. Marilyn Bouillon, was president of the student body in 19, what year? Uh, Ma'am? <laughs> 1942. <laughs> Forty nineteen. That's when I lived here. I was five. Now, we lived in faculty house one for ten months, and that was the year you were president of student body. Would you all welcome Marilyn Duran, please? <laughs> and I think I have this right. If you like the flowers that are growing on the square in Oxford, I think her son has the green thumb. Is that right? Isn't he the man who does the flowers? I see. Every time I see him, I tell him how beautiful they are. How much we appreciate it. And I've completely lost control of this program. <laughs> <laughs> Will you answer the question? But we're so glad that you're Well, with you know, us. when you're an author, Charles, it's just kind of hard to. <laughs> so I want to do one other thing, and I'll get back to your question. That is, I want Neil White to stand up. Because I want, well, first thing I want to say to you all, students, uh, older people, uh, if you want to write, number one, you find a great editor. There is a great editor. Neil, will you stand up, please? Neil. Please, stand up. Come on. Uh, uh, he, uh, he has all the qualities you would want uh, an editor to have. 
Uh, he's patient for one thing. Uh, you know, one of the reasons Robert is so popular is before the night is out, he's going to go seat by seat and uh, identify each person and how great they are and why they're his best friend. Well, I might. I actually wrote the book so I'd have an opportunity to speak to an audience and tell them how great they are and so forth. Well, you know, I, the reason I wrote the book is I suspect, I'm not, this, is not, this is not political, okay? I suspect everybody in this room has a life that has produced at least the seeds of some wonderful stories. I just know it's true. Uh, I think we all look at our lives that way. And if you look back over time, regardless if it's 18 years or 88 years, there were events that occurred that truly were unique to you and to your family and to your friends and to your school and to your company. Wherever, you, wherever life has taken you. And I just say to you, if you think about it and it, you, you're attracted to the idea, get an agent, get a little advice and go to it. Because when you start writing the stories, they just, it, they just come out of the ground like that uh, lava that's flowing over there uh, across the ocean. That's how it, the stories just keep coming out. Names start appearing that you haven't thought about in a long time. And here they come. And always there's a story like Darlene. Darlene. I told you. What is your married name, Darlene? <laughs> huh? No, I know what your maiden name was. What's your? Lominic. See, we were, yeah, Lominic. That's her husband right there. Okay, so we were in school together at Moss Point. And I can tell you that Darlene has some 10th grade biology stories. Because I was in the class with her. And it was a unique time in our history. Well, anyway, I'm going to get on with it. I wrote the book because uh, my life has been very public. I mean, it's a lot more public than some lives, but some a lot more public than mine. But throughout the years, I began to realize that what I was doing was of the public interest. I thought it was because they were writing about it in the newspaper. I mean, it was on sports pages first, and then it went into the general news. And then it got into the letters to the editor complaining about my behavior or something I said or did. And then it got into being chancellor. And it's all in, it's all in the public domain. So I thought, maybe I have some stories to tell that got me to where I went to today. To today. It's how I happen to be here today, what I think I know. Uh, but I wanted to share with people who have thought about some of the places I've been through the years but maybe have never been there. And, and one of the places was on a football field. And I know enough people who love football who haven't had the privilege of playing in Yankee Stadium or the Los Angeles Coliseum. I mean, not everybody gets to do that. So I tried to write about those places and how they struck me at the time. And so I, I, I think the word is like public trust. I mean, I was in the public domain a lot. And I felt like I ought to tell that story if I can tell it. And there's the answer right there. Mr. That's Neil great. White, he'll be telling the story. And Robert, did you write this book for a particular group of people, or is it a broad general audience? I, for a small group, to my daughter, Margaret, who's right there, and my son, Robert, who's in Atlanta. In Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, I, I thought, if nothing else, this would be information that they might like to have mm -hmm. at some point. So every year in your life has been a good year. Uh, you've done so much. You, you focused in on 1960, which has, as we know from the cover here, the uh, advantage of also being your number, 60. 60. Uh, so why 1960? Uh, a year of? Inflection. Infle inflection. <laughs> She's taught me a word. It's a real popular word, inflection. And I thought 1960 was a year of inflection. Think about it. Uh, we can start with President Kennedy running for president and being elected, first Catholic president. We can come to Ole Miss, and we have not one Miss America, but two Miss Americas. We won the Sugar Bowl. We beat LSU 21 to nothing. Bill Cannon made eight yards. LSU made minus 15, just a little tidbit, you know? <laughs> WNOE radio in New Orleans was saying, from the mile-high weather eye, the score is Ole Miss 21, LSU nothing. 
<laughs> Most people of LSU hated it so bad. But anyway, so that's two things going on in 1960. About the same time, the civil rights movement was starting to really heat up. And I can't speak for anybody in the room but me, but I don't believe until 1956, when I came to Ole Miss, I'd ever heard the word segregation. Now that, I know that sounds like foreign, in law school we call that dictum. Uh, that is not dictum, that's the truth. I just hadn't heard it. I, it wasn't, and when those people started having the sit-ins at the lunch counters and marching in the streets, those people being people who were promoting civil rights as they should have been, I was thinking, I don't think they ought to do that. That's against the law. Well, there's a great big lesson there for us, and we've had a reminder of it this year, and it seems that we're making some progress in trying to realize the aspirations of all the people of this country who want America to be as great as it can be. Uh, so, uh, did I answer that question? You did, you did a good Thank job you. of it. Um, of course, he'd do it. he could read the phone book, and I'd be interested in it. Uh, so, uh, 1960, you start out January 1, 1960. Right. I mean, how much better could it be than with a Super Bowl, I mean, a Sugar Bowl victory? Uh, uh, and so, I wanted to ask you, because you were good enough to put in there a little prelude uh, in the fa fall of 59, which led to this Sugar Bowl, about probably the most famous game uh, in our lifetime, uh, Ole Miss and LSU. Right. And I learned a few things, how Paul Dietzel watered down the field to slow y'all down. True. So just tell us how it was to be there, and then I know why y'all lost, but I want to hear from you why Ole Miss lost to LSU in that Halloween night game. <laughs> That's called a hard question, but I'm gonna give you. I'll give it a shot. Uh, we really had a better team than LSU. Mm -hmm. They had Billy Cannon, who became the Heisman Trophy winner and was probably the best player in America. He could run fast and strong and all that. But we had a few too, like Charlie Flowers and others. Uh, but the LSU game was as hyped as probably anything that any of us have ever experienced in our lives. The stadium seat would seat about 60,000 people. Uh, it was sold out, and it was sold out so much that there were stories of people trading boats and cars for tickets. Uh, I, my favorite story is the fellow who showed up at the gate that the officials enter in dressed in an official's uniform. <laughs> and he wasn't an official, but he walked in the gate with them. And so he's in there for the game, and the game's being played, and he's sitting over there watching the game be played, you know? And so when, it, when 10 minutes and 59 seconds, 10 minutes and 59 seconds left comes in the game, he stands up when Billy Cannon catches that punt. And you can see it in the film, one of the films, that. Billy's running down the sideline in front of our bench. Feet water, mud's doing like this every step. Here's this official just behind our bench. He's running right step for step with Billy Cannon. And Billy, by the time he gets to the end zone, he's hyperventilating. This official is not breathing hard at all. He, he's turned into the end zone and hugs Cannon. <laughs> I mean, that's worth the whole film, you know. But well, it was a heartbreaking event because if, if we won that game, we would have won a national championship. And Charlie Flowers would have won the Heisman Trophy, probably. But we didn't. Cannon won the game. So the best player in the country in the biggest game made the biggest play. There's something. But Ole Miss should have won. They had it. Uh, they were driving. They were down there. They, it was in their grasp to win it. It was. And they didn't win it because. Because. Uh, we had a sophomore quarterback, Doug Elmore, who was great. He took us straight. Well, let me get, I have to tell a little bit more now. Yeah, sure. Make this. All right. You're the author. <laughs> okay, so there were funny substitution rules in those days. If you started a quarter, you could come out and go back in. If you didn't start the quarter, but you were playing and you came out, you couldn't go, but you were dead. You had to sign in with an official. That's sort of, that's, uh, that's pre-internet, 
I might mm -hmm. say. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the first team, our first team, really great players, like just an incredible list. Uh, they, had, they came out of the game after Billy's run because they were winded. I went on the second team, blue team. They were red team, I'm blue team. We go out on the field, we take the ball, psh, we move right down the field. We wear state out, I mean LSU out, and we get down to the eight yard line. It's first and goal on the eight, and we have a sophomore fullback who about, some people would say about a half smart, he thought he could score. So he told, court told Doug, I can take it and give it to me. So he gave it to him, no yards, second eight. So Doug Elmore runs roll out left, goes to the three, runs roll out right, goes to the one. It's now fourth down and one, and there are 58 seconds or so left in the game. And what should have happened, well, we didn't make it, okay? He, he, he had another mistake made, and he didn't make it. So we lose the game. What should have happened is when we, we get, when we made it to the eight yard line, first and goal, our coach or one of the players on the field, but the fact is there wasn't anybody on the field who could call timeout because you had to be a captain to call timeout. We didn't have any captains, they were over on the bench. So Coach Falk could have called timeout. And Coach Kenny's right there and he knows about this, but so if, if he had called timeout and put the red team back in the game with Jake Gibbs or Bobby Franklin fresh at quarterback, and uh, 11 players, all of whom who wanted to, went straight to the National Football League or the American Football League. There were 13 of us on that team that did that. Anyway, he didn't do it. And he was watching the game. And I think he, I, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. I think that he thought that Doug Elmore had taken us down the field, boom, 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 let him take it in the end zone. Well, and he would have but one person made a mistake on the block. And uh, it ended the way it ended. Coach Falk didn't put the first team in and we lost. I cried then, I was 13 years old, and I almost cried again when I read about it in the book. <laughs> uh, that's a great uh, way you told that. And then of course, that led to the uh, Sugar Bowl rematch. Right. And uh, that was a great game, well, totally dominated. For us it was, but it was a strange, a strange match. And no, none of us on the, some of the guys who were tuned in to how business is done may have known why we played that game. I don't know why LSU agreed to play us in the Sugar Bowl. Right. I never did know that. Well, something big happened in your life uh, just before the Sugar Bowl, and you write about it, uh, and you're very honest about it. You actually signed <laughs> a contract to play for the Cleveland Browns while you were still uh, eligible to play for Ole Miss in football and in baseball. I did. So that was not a great thing for you to do, but you did it. So you want to talk about uh, how that transpired? Is this hooked into the NCAA headquarters? <laughs> uh, what happened is the best kicker in pro football was a man named Lou Groza. And I just idolized Lou Groza. I grew up idolizing Lou Groza. It's number 76. He was, he's in the Hall of Fame. He's a great guy. So. I get drafted by Cleveland, the Cleveland Browns, and that's who Lou played for. And uh, I'm in the hotel in New Orleans uh, the night before the game, and he called my room. I nearly fainted when he called me. And so he, he says, Bobby, uh, this is Lou Groza. Uh, I'd like to talk to you. <laughs> I said, well, I'd like to talk to you too, Mr. Groza. <laughs> anyway, he, he came up to the room, and he came with a man named uh, Ed Dick Evans, who was an, another coach for Cleveland. I'd been drafted by the Cleveland Browns, and he, we talked. I called my brother, who was playing in the NFL at that time. I needed somebody to be there with me. So he comes to my room, there are four of us, and Mr. Groza says, well, Coach Brown sent me down here with a contract and a check. We want to sign you to play for the Cleveland Browns. And I said, well, I would like to do it, but, I mean, I'm going to do it. But... Uh, I'm gonna try to play baseball in spring. I can't do both. He said, oh yeah, you can. We got a way to handle that. I said, well, tell me how. He said, we're gonna give your brother the check and he's gonna put it in his account and he'll hold it for you. And we're gonna sign a contract and we're gonna put it in the file cabinet in Cleveland and not gonna say a word about it. So, you know, as they say, the, there's some devil in every one of us and the devil made me do it, but I said, okay, let's do it. I never had a thousand dollars in my life. Didn't think I ever would, but 
And a ten thousand dollar contract, by the way, to at least know how much money we were making. Uh, and I was the highest paid lineman on the Redskin team by the time I got there. But the, so I'm, I leave there. We win the Sugar Bowl. Everything's great. I'm at Ole Miss. We're practicing baseball with Coach Swayze every day. And I'm thinking, we're going to have a great season. we got Jake Gibbs, who's going to make All-American. We've got three really good pitchers. All of us can hit. About six of us are football players. Kind of thought we were tough. But anyway, we won the Southeastern Conference in baseball. But before that happened, in March, I think it was March, headlines in the Clarion Ledger and the Commercial Appeal, Kayette traded to Redskins. My phone rings, it's Coach Swayze. He's, what in the hell is going on here? He says, I said, Coach, I hate to tell you, I said, but I signed a contract it down to Sugar Bowl. He said, God, are you crazy? I said, well, they told me, Mr. Brown wrote me a letter, I got the letter. He said they'd keep it under wraps until I finished the baseball season. He said, okay. So they put out this news item that said, Kayat, not the property of the, of the Browns to trade that I'd been drafted by them, but I had I owed them nothing, which I did. I actually owed them $11,000 <laughs> uh, anyway, but he said that. So it blew over, which is kind of amazing, but if you think about the visibility of the NCAA today, that would not blow over today. I think Paul Feinbaum and his callers would be all over that today. <laughs> yeah. But you got away with it, didn't you? I did, and we won 23 games and lost two, won the Southeastern Conference yeah. for the second year in a row. And should have uh, gone to the College World Series. So this kind of gets into that gets us into race. Your, your issue of uh, race. Yeah. Why, so why did y'all not go to the College World Series? Because the college board had a rule that we couldn't play oh, Mississippi schools, white only schools, could not play against. Um, but then in those days they said Negro. Or integrated or, or teams. Or even have the chance to play against Negroes or in, on integrated teams. And so we got the word the day we beat Florida for the championship that we weren't going to play anymore that year. And we just, all of, us, all of us except Dan Jordan, who was the smartest person on our team, later the uh, president of Monticello, by the way, and a superb man, PhD in history, and, and he was on our team. He was a relief pitcher. And he, uh, he wrote a letter to Dr. E.R. Job, who was, was the, uh, I guess the, uh, the, in the uh, college board manager. Uh, I forget the title now. Probably executive director. Executive director. And so, he uh, he wrote him and asked him to, to waive, get them to waive the rule, and he never heard from Dr. Job. So, we finished baseball season. It was over. And so we two years in a row we could have gone and didn't get to go. To, to the NCAA, and might have won it the second year because we had that good I, team. I love the way Robert would describe his friends who played uh, on teams with him. He always had a distinctive way of describing things. And Dan Jordan, who's a terrific guy, a uh, longtime friend of Robert, a friend of mine, he was a pitcher for Ole Miss. And Robert told me one day, he said, Dan had a curveball that started in Water Valley and ended up in baseball. <laughs> And it was going 31 miles an hour. That's the beauty of it. These hitters do like this, you know. So, um, so you go uh, into the uh, pros, and instead of playing for the Browns, you're playing for the Reds. I'm going to play the Redskins. I go to the All Star game first. Okay. Yeah, I don't need to, that's in the book if anybody wants to read that's it. That's right. Yeah. So we. We're going to skip over that because we're going to run out of time where you won't have time to introduce those people on the back row. Um, uh, so I wanted to ask you how, how it was uh, playing for the Redskins. Okay, so in those days, each of the NFL teams had a TV network. And some of you who had been anywhere near my age will know that in the Deep South, the Redskins were on our, we were on their network. I watched them every Sunday from the time I was in eighth grade on. And so I knew the Redskins, and my brother played for the Redskins uh, in 19, started in 56. Uh, uh, so going to the Redskins was different from anything I've ever done. Uh, it's the, way, the regimen for training was very different. It was much easier and lighter, and people smoked, and they drank beer and food around and that sort of thing. I was just watching it because I didn't drink beer or smoke. 
at the time. Uh, but uh, it was wonderful to be a place kicker on that team because what I did, I played guard, second team guard, but I kicked. And so I didn't have to get out there and do one-on-one and all that stuff that the, the linemen do to get ready for the year. And those great big guys, I mean, they're really big. And they're bigger now than they were then, of course. Yeah. yeah. So so you were a place kicker. And you, uh, at one point, kicked a 50-yard field goal, which was unheard of back then. Well, it, that was the longest kick at the time. And so uh, tell, tell us the difference between the way you kicked it straight on <laughs> and the way they kick them now. And, yeah. and could, you have, could you have adapted to the soccer type stuff? Okay. No more. I probably could not have. I mean, I was so schooled into the traditional kick. I probably, anybody play golf in here? I know <laughs> Billy Kenny does. You play golf too. I know you do. Gondine. Who else? It's the same thing as a golf club. It's actually a, the way they kick, it's a golf swing. They they take their leg back and they hit it and they hit an angle and they hit it like this. Mm-hmm. And so they can kick it farther than the traditional kickers could, that I could. Uh, if you notice their kickoffs, they all go into the back of the end zone. Well, that's 65 yards to the goal line, 10 over 75. That is a long kick. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that, I, I don't think I could have done it. And timing is just so much a part of our lives. I started in 60. My last year would have been 64. Uh, but I left because I was in law school and I really enjoyed law school and we were getting our brains whipped every week at Washington. So I was kind of ready to get out. But uh, the next year is when the soccer style place kicker showed up. They would just the old Mr. Marshall would just wave bye bye to me when I <laughs> drive driving back south. Hey, t- tell us about how you got paid uh, on a uh, <laughs> weekly basis for the Redskins. Every week, all the players went to the Redskin office and saw Mr. Chester Minner, who was a financial officer for the Redskins, and he'd give you a little brown envelope about that big, and mine, $10,000 had $833.33 in it. We got paid in cash. Now, I don't know if another multi-million dollar business that does that, but that's the way it was done. And I put mine in the bank. You know, I'd learned about tithing and 10%, so I knew. So uh, did you, do you look at the salaries today and just kind of shake your head and maybe wish you had lived at a different time? No, <laughs> I really don't. I, I mean, I wouldn't mind. They make ten thousand dollars in a quarter now. A quarter. They get paid by the game. Uh, uh, we got. We were paid a hundred and no. We we paid fifty dollars for preseason. We played six preseason ga- preseason games. Fifty dollars in our laundry, our food, and our dormitory room. Those guys get full game checks for preseason nowadays. Anyway, that's okay. They talk about exhibition games for a minute. So when you were at Ole Miss on the football team at Ole Miss, what was the total number of losses your teams had? Uh, four. Four losses. And, and uh, then uh, for the exhibition season, of uh, the preseason at the Redskins, how many losses did they have? Well, we lost six. <laughs> so you have more losses in the preseason. Preseason. Than- well, I lost – I played on a losing team in the All-Star game. Played in six uh, preseason Redskins. That's seven. Then we won one game, tied two, and lost nine. So it's having nine, 16. So we lost, I played in 16 games. Then I was selected to play in the Pro Bowl, which is a real honor, you know? So I go to to Los Angeles to play in the Coliseum. And I'm feeling good, we get beat there too. So that's 17 losses. And, and, and but it was a different world. I kicked in the All-Star game on Friday night in Chicago. I flew to San Francisco Saturday morning ate supper with the Redskins, kicked off Sunday. That's been 48 hours. Fly down to L.A. to Los Angeles, practice four days. I kick off Friday night. So I play in three games in seven days, and I made 50, 50, and 150, 200, what's that? $300. $300. Well, uh, I mean, it's okay. I mean, it was kind of fun, you know, just playing, everybody smoking tariffs and cigarettes. And <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you mentioned the Pro Bowl. Uh, you took a big hit. I did in the Pro Bowl that ended up affecting you the rest of your life. I did. Uh, and I wanted to ask you: Would today uh, that be considered targeting? The were you hit uh, by the 
He hit helmet. me in the head. He hit me in the right, his in the, helmet? right in the sternum. With his helmet. But I think it was his size and strength that did it. I mean, he was. So, talk about was, that for a minute. Well, he was 6'10, and he weighed about 260. Smart as a whip. Played for San Francisco. And I was a kickoff guy, so I kick off, and I'm watching the ball, and the guy's going to field it. I should have been watching Bob St. Clair, because he was watching me, and boom, he hits me right here. I go down and I'm kind of dazed. And in those days, you didn't call timeout when you got hurt. You started crawling for the sideline or get get off the field. So I'd be able to do that. And uh, then it got better. And I came back, went to school, went down to Vicksburg to practice teach. And one morning I woke up with a stomach ache and ended up in the hospital and surgery. And the doctor opened me up and here's my pancreas, which was supposed to be about that that big. About that big, and it was red, and I was all full of stuff in my abdominal cavity. So four months later, I got out of the hospital, and I'd lost 85 pounds, and uh, had three surgeries, and had more to do. Before you almost was, died, didn't you? I came real close to that. I sure did. Uh, and then you had uh, bouts with uh, your pancreas through the years. Through the yeah. years, a lot of, right. a lot yeah. of times. Yeah. That one hit. It was a serious hit. <laughs> it was life changing for me, and I didn't know it until later that that really was what had bruised my abdominal cavity. And, mm. But you know, you learn a lot when you have that kind of adversity. Yeah. So, so today, I, that guy would have been called for targeting. Um, let me say one other thing about that. My mother, my darling mother, who's in this book, stayed in my room for four months, sleeping in a chair. She was a licensed practical nurse and she took care of me. I had a registered nurse who was our, we paid her and she was great. She was really funny. One day the doctor came in, he's bossing around with his white coat on. I don't want to offend any doctors, but this is kind of cute. When they, when they come in, he's got this white coat on, he's bossing, he's looking at it. He writes his stuff on the chart. This, this lady was my nurse and she looked, I'm over there kind of half cocked on something called dolphin, you know, I'm, enjoying the ride a little bit. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, she looks at that and she says, excuse me, that crazy son of a bitch is getting to try to kill you. He said, we're not gonna do any of this. I said, I said it's okay with me. <laughs> that's, a, that's amazing. And, that was uh, really funny. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny now because we know everything turned out well. But see, I was really doped up and, and but I still figured out what she was saying, you know. <laughs> But you write movingly in the book that you were really addicted when you came out, and it took your mother to help get you my off mother that did. addiction. Yeah, they gave my mother two vials of this stuff called dolphin, which is an artificial morphine the Germans developed in World War II. So we go home with these two little vials, and my mother has her needles, and that's in the days when they boil the needles before they gave you a shot. So anyway, every night about 9.30, I'd get a shot. How do you feel? I said, oh, mom, you know, my sister, she'd give me a shot. And that went on and went on. So one day she shot me, no night. How do you feel? I said, oh. I said, that shot is saving me. She said, well, I am glad because it's water that I'm getting. <laughs> I've been giving you water now for two. She, she weaned She you weaned off of, me off of mm -hmm. it. I never was addicted again. I mean, there were times when people thought I was, right, <laughs> Margaret? But I wasn't. Anyway. So Robert, it's, uh, looking back on all the football games you played uh, and starred in, what what would be your personal uh, highlight, the best memory you have of a specific play or event? We played Tennessee in Memphis in 1959, and with less than 10 seconds on the clock, a little, a little fellow named Jimmy Hall caught a pass, zigzagged, and ran out of bounds like on the 40. So we had time for one play and the score was tied seven to seven. I go in to kick and the wind's blowing and it's cold at Crump Stadium. It's a 40, 59, ended about 58 yard kick. So anyway, I made it. And that was it. I mean, that was that was the way they drew it up. You know, if you can get out of bounds, get a kick, you win the half leading. So I'd say that was one of the high water marks. The kick at Yankee Stadium would have been. 50 then, yard kick. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yankee Stadium was a lot. Um, we're going to talk about your father in a minute, but didn't your father say to you and your brother when you went up there as kids uh, in Yankees and visiting Yankee Stadium, 
said you boys are going to play there one day? I'm, I'm going to come see you boys play there one day. Wow. Yeah, and so we all, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to be playing catcher for the Yankees. That's what I'm going to be doing. But we, neither of us thought we'd ever play there, and we both played there. Football. Yeah. So uh, there are a lot, you write movingly about your father as well as your mother, and honestly, too. But the first part I want to ask you about your father is – he really gave you good advice early, including pretty specific techniques on uh, how to kick and do other things. How did he know that stuff? Because he really wasn't an athlete himself, was he? He was. But yeah. But he was giving you advice about how to kick the ball. How did he know how to kick the ball? He done how it? he knew he coached it, but he he uh, he was real smart and uh, and very well educated and knew how to communicate and you really knew how to communicate with me directly you know and uh he taught me he told me if i wanted to play football i'll be a place kicker i always have a job if i want to play baseball i'll be a catcher because nobody else wanted to catch now he gave you that advice uh, he didn't give eddie that advice eddie was different we had <laughs> so talk about talk about that a minute Y'all oh, have, in some ways kind of a parallel athletic career but in other ways uh different so talk about that well eddie my daddy was lebanese he was dark skinned and eddie is dark skinned and i was a blonde blue eye and my mother was scott irish so we were very different uh and eddie was quiet and somber and later mean as a cobra snake and that's just the truth darlene can tell you that uh but it served him well because he had to operate with less physical equipment and skill some of his uh, competitors, and made it, he made it to the NFL and and played ten years and coached twenty three. So he had thirty three years in professional football and a scholarship to Tulane, all of which was he earned with his commitment. Tried out at Ole Miss, didn't want him. Tried out at State, they didn't want him. So he ends up at, at Tulane and had a good career. Uh, I was different. Uh, I was naive then like I have been most of my life and and gullible I agree I mostly agreed with anything anybody told me uh, and Eddie was different he was always aggressive and in getting into it and my dad was a real uh, uh, well he was strong and go get her go get her and dictatorial and he told us both what to do and Eddie told him to go jump and I told him, yes, sir. And that was a difference in Eddie and me. I mean, Eddie's shooting poo on the streets of Moss Point when he's 13 and he's smoking a cigar. <laughs> and he's, you know, and he's, my daddy walks by and looks at him and says, Eddie, get out. And he grabbed him and pulled him out. I said, you can't do that. Eddie said, hell, I can't. Dad said, you can't eat at my table. I'm going to eat at that table. That's my house. That's where I live. I'm going to eat there. My daddy just left. <laughs> If that had been me, then not me across the line. <laughs> so anyway. so, so uh, your father was one of the best-known people in South Mississippi. Maybe in, maybe maybe all, in Mississippi. Maybe yeah. all of Mississippi. Yeah. And um, very popular. Uh, and he decided to run against uh, all another popular congressman, Bill Calmer. Right. Uh, and looking, looking at it from afar, you'd say, well, you never beat Bill Calmer. So why did he decide to run against an incumbent, entrenched incumbent, popular congressman? Well, he wanted to be—he wanted to be a national public official. My dad did, <clears throat> um, and so he had talked to Mr. Calmer, and Mr. Calmer had served for 35 years, uh, and and told my dad that I will support you if you will wait till I resign, retire, and I'm going to do that at the end of this term. Well, it was this term, next term, <laughs> next term. And my dad is aging every time that happens and getting more exposure. So he just decided to run against him. My mother begged him not to do it. I begged him not to do it. We tried to tell him that a congressman can do more accidentally for his constituents than a candidate can working 24 hours a day. I mean, Mr. Comer had a staff. He had administrative assistants. Trent Lott end up being his administrative assistant and so it wasn't going to happen and he did he ran a, an aggressive race but no he, he ran twice and soon after that second effort he was investigated by the internal revenue service for uh misspending county funds 
on private property, not his property, but private property, which he did. And I think most every supervisor, this doesn't make it right, but every supervisor in Mississippi was probably doing that. But what my daddy would do is this Escatawa or Creole Baptist Church wanted a basketball court or a tennis court, he would pay the parking lot and tell them to put basketball goals up on both ends and tennis standards between it where they would go and he would pay for it with county money. Well, that is not, that doesn't come within the scope of the law. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Mike Moore, who I put in this book, became district attorney and, and he was tied in with a man who didn't like my dad and there were plenty of those. A lot of them did like him. Uh, but Mike went after daddy just with a vengeance and stayed after him. It got him on eight counts, eight different charges. He tried the first one, and he, my dad was prevailed. Tried the second one, felt it came in a hung, a hung jury. And so his lawyer boy, Solomon, said, I think we better settle this, so they did. And then he resigned from his office. He'd been there 37 years and had done a lot of good, a lot of good. But it was time, it was just a little late. Mm -hmm. Well, he uh, tried to help so many people. Uh, uh, you either wrote this specifically, or I took from it in general, that your father really spent more time helping people in the community than he spent time with you and uh, your family. Yeah, would it be inappropriate for me to read something? Not at all. My mother wrote, a, after my daddy lost his job, and. There's several good stories. I know we're probably out of time. No, we're good. Okay. This is a, a very, very right. poignant. So uh, I put this in the book because it tells you it's the truth about my father. He was about as successful as a county official could be. I mean, he was popular. He knew every, he made speeches all over the place and was well liked. But my mother wrote this about my father, and it's pretty short. So he felt cheated out of his mother's life and love. So he was hungry for affection. He wanted the best for his family at his own sacrifice. He became so involved and even obsessed with this drive that instead of becoming the winner in the end, he was the loser. His children were deprived of the privilege of knowing the real man as their mother knew him before he was so involved. He goes on to say, unbelievable demands are made on a man in this field. And there's always someone waiting for an opportunity to pounce. But did ever there live a great man who was never a victim of criticism? The fighter, the go-getter, the man who gets things done. Consequently, he is in the limelight. He's the one who gets the publicized criticism. Not the man who sits back and does nothing. You'll never see his name in the paper except for his obituary. It's like a fighter. It's easy to say I quit, but you have to live with your conscience. I would be much more humi humiliated with a quitter than with a fighter, even if he lost. You never really lose until you stop trying. I mean, I think that's a powerful letter, and it's so, in two and a half paragraphs, summarized my daddy's life. He became obsessed with public service. And he went at it 5.30 in the morning till 10.30 at night, traveled all the time. Uh, anyway. So you got that hard work ethic uh, I did. from I him? Off, I watched it from her and him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. And we were, we were, our family was, well, we had four children, older sister, older brother, me, and my younger sister, and my mother and daddy. And we were not, we were not, I wouldn't say we were poverty poor, but we were poor. And my mother made the most out of what, she had to work with, and my dad tried, and but, but he got once he got into public life, he became sort of a, like a bridge. I, I wrote this somewhere. He's kind of like a bridge or a highway. I mean, it, that was what he did. And she, on the other hand, maintained our house and us and the eternal truths, the values that really do uh, enable you to live productive, noble lives. I mean. My mother was big on respect for everybody. White, black, it didn't make any difference. She was respect and honor and honesty and loyalty and diligence and humor. I mean, she was really funny. My dad had one woman who called him two or three mornings a week. And of course, the phone was in the kitchen. And he'd be eating and talking. 
But when he was not there, this lady would want to talk to my daddy, I mean to my mother. And so her name was Miss Ellers. And the phone would ring and mom would say, oh, hey, Miss Ellers, how are you? And she would da 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 And mama would put the phone down <laughs> on the counter and go over to the stove and cook, come back and say, are you kidding? And put it back down. <laughs> Miss Ellers never had a clue because she was doing all the talking. So that's the truth, I swear. That's, yeah, true. that's good. I want to turn to the audience. This is a conversation, and I want to give you the chance to uh, engage Robert in this conversation. If you have a question, raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you and we'll get to our Zoom audience in a minute. But let's start here in the auditorium. Who will start? The question is, is he ever going to stop talking? Is that <laughs> right, right here. Yes, sir. Hang, hang on. Just wait for the microphone. Jimmy Brown. That's Jimmy Brown. Yeah. Chancellor, did you and all the great rebels realize you were living the dream when you were at Ole Miss? Charlie Flowers called it Camelot. That was the name he gave to it. You know, in Camelot, I think the court jester sings to the queen, my queen, my queen, you're euthaning, I think is what he says. You hear that? Euthaning. You tell that to any lady, and she'd be glad to hear it, I'm telling you. <laughs> so you were living the dream. We, I think we were. I mean, it was a great time to go to school. We had 3,000 students, had good football teams, uh, beautiful campus really uh, wonderful teachers. I told somebody recently about Zoom education, and I, I said one of the things that I would miss is when we were students, we had some faculty members. When they would finish a class, a lecture, I would want to clap. I mean, I would really want to applaud. It would be particularly in history and English, because I didn't understand math and science, you know, so. That's great. Yes, sir, uh, right here. So, Jimmy, I well, do I, think, I think we knew it. I don't have so much as a, a question as I have a comment. I still have that 1960 Sugar Bowl pennant on my wall. <laughs> good. <laughs> good That's you. Thank you. That's good. Wave it. I kiss it every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's it, was, why I, it I, was a good time. It was. Well, but it well, wasn't all right. You know, I, it, we that business about keeping black people out of school was just, it was just wrong. And, and uh, it took a long time for us to begin to wake up about that. And, uh, and we're still waking up, I might add. That's addressed in the book very it well. Is, yeah. Over here, anybody? In the back. Um, what would you say is one thing you learned from kind of the interruption of your career from injury? What, what uh, did you learn uh, from your career that involved injuries? Injury. Uh, you know, I don't know what the rules are today, uh, but when we when we played and we weren't, I don't think we're as good as players are today. We certainly weren't as big or as strong or as fast. There were some people who were, but not many. Uh, but we were taught that uh, you get up, when you get hit, you get up and play. If you can't play, you get off the field, or off the court, or off but wherever you are. And uh, I would say one of the lessons I learned was uh, tenacity, and I won't call it courage, but I just say the ability to sustain something that's negative and harmful and still get back up and go again. And, and I will say that sometimes people who play sports get uh, criticized for saying, I learned so many lessons. I learned so many. But the truth is you really do learn a lot of lessons that serve you well for the rest of your life. I think about a tennis player. Think about just how, I'm not, I never played tennis, but think about how much courage it takes on that hot court to keep Hanging that ball back and forth and running and running and running. I mean, that's that's commitment, seems to me. Robert, when you were chancellor, after having had such a successful career in football, did you ever have the urge to uh, help coach the team while you were <laughs> chancellor? No, thank you. I did not want to be your coach. I, uh, I, I mean, I had an opinion. I tried not to let anybody know what it was. But... Uh, uh, it I seems just, to just be a natural thing to. It might be, but and maybe some people do that. But it seems to me when you play, when you play, and when you're through, you're out. 
and you support the people who are in. Mm -hmm. And that would be true about most anything. It'd be true about the museum, for example. And, yeah, well, you've done, and you've done that. I still like to edit the newspaper every day that I read. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, other uh, questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am, back here. <laughs> If your son or like anybody in this room wanted to follow the same path you did with a professional football career, like what would be your one biggest piece of advice to them? My brother and I played, but my son did not play professional and didn't try to play professionally. He played high school sports, but he came to Ole Miss and had a full college life here and, and loved it and got was employed pretty soon. He had several jobs in town. and around and did well in school. And went on to law school at Vanderbilt and now has a law firm in Atlanta. But he's got very strong uh, work, uh, strong work ethic. He, he understands discipline and taking care of your clients and being honorable and straightforward. So Robert, if a young person came to you today though and said, what, what advice can you give me to be able to pursue a professional career in football or athletics? What would you say? Well, first of all, I say I really don't know the answer to that question anymore because it's a different world. It seems to me that there are a lot of places that train young people to be strong and quicker and jump higher. And I think you need to find out who they are and where they are, and there are plenty of people to tell you. Uh, and then you participate in that. I know some people, some, some high school athletes go to a place in Florida that some of you all probably know about uh, where they teach young men and women the values of athletics and it really is built on a value scale it seems to me mm -hmm. that the whole enterprise mm -hmm. is well the, the players question right here and then we'll get to don your book was very personal that's my reflection after reading yeah. it did your children know all the stories that were in there before it was published? And if not, what surprised them? Big, big for you. We knew most oh. of the stories. <laughs> uh, some of the stuff about my grandfather was surprising and was fun to read. Uh, but for the most part, we knew the stories. Good. Thank you for the question. Don. Uh, Chancellor was baseball always secondary or were there ever any opportunities uh, there and had that been would you would you pursue for me that? For baseball you, uh, was first I, I really wanted to play professional baseball and had an opportunity to play to sign with the cubs uh who were on the bottom at the time uh may still be i don't know i hadn't followed it but i couldn't i didn't have strong enough arm to make it to, if you don't make it to the big leagues you don't want to play i don't think and i could have gone to triple to, to double a right out of college. That's about what we played in college. But that would have been it. And in pro football, you were either in the big leagues or you were at home. So thank you for the question. But yeah, no, I, baseball was my primary love. I, but I, it turned out you were better in football. Well, I had a way to get into football, mm -hmm. that kicking business. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, yes. All right. Robert. Hey. Um, you may or not, may not remember when you had just become chancellor, remember we had a, a meeting with the faculty senate and I was happened to be secretary of the faculty senate at the time and I won't say who was the president, you may remember. I do. And, and he, <laughs> I we remember. Had a, we had a breakfast or a luncheon with you and, and our teams were not doing really well at that time. That's true. And in fact, the, the president of the faculty senate said, you know, maybe we ought to consider moving down a division level in yeah. sports. And you. You objected to that, and I don't know if you remember what you said. I don't. You, but you talked about the importance of, of athletics to a university and to the people playing it and to the spirit of the university, et cetera. And I remember you kind of vigorously rejected that notion. Well, I hope I did it with respect. I? <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't work. Here's the thing about America. We have a value, set of values in this country, and we place a high value on on uh, uh, notoriety, and we place a high value on athletics. I mean, we're willing for uh, Tom Brady to make have a hundred million a year he makes, uh, or for a boxer to make several million, or a basketball player to 
just the, the money just pours into those professional sports. And colleges across the country have made huge investments in their athletics programs. I mean, you think about the, the just if you look at Mark and I were driving out of here and there's a stadium and then there's a pavilion and there's a baseball stadium and then there's a girls women's softball uh, facility and then there's a track and there's a weight room and I mean it's all over the place. And I think there's a law school around there that's got your name on it too. <laughs> yeah, well, I tell you the kind of call I got about that. A fellow I knew called me and said, is it true they're going to name that law school for you? He was angry about me, I guess because of something I did or didn't do. Anyway, I said, well, I think they're going to name the building. He said, not the school. I said, no, not the school. He said, well, okay. <laughs> I said, friend of mine, friend of mine. <laughs> It's not all strawberries, you know. It's not... <laughs> That's good. Any, anybody else here in the audience? Yes, ma'am, in the back. I got to tell one more story. I know they like this story. I would say you've experienced a lot in your life, like civil rights movement, playing two sports. What made you just keep going? Uh, I, I think the values. I don't want to be too heavy on my, I do believe in values, but I think the lessons I learned from my mother and father and the people I observed as I came along and the ones I admired most were people who were uh, uh, the equivalent of two sport athletes. I mean, they, people who were good athletes maybe or good in the band or the core music group, but also made good grades and had high aspirations and would step out and lead and there, there are just a lot of people capable of doing that. And if you learn to recognize that a person has that quality and is interested, and you can help enable them to move into those kinds of positions, that's, that's a good investment to make. And I understood that early on. Uh, my dad wanted me to run for the Senate. And I wasn't thinking about running for I didn't. He had all the politics my family ever needed uh, and some. But, uh, I didn't want to do that. I loved the university. I fell in love with it in 1956, and I was struggling to survive academically because I wasn't prepared. Uh, but and a lot of it was a struggle, but it was such a rich community. It was uh, the men and women on the faculty and the students and the staff. Uh, I don't know, it was just this great bond of affection. And uh, so, no, I didn't. I, I was happy with the route I was on. I, I want to give our Zoom audience a chance to ask a question. Can I tell them one if story? If you want to ask a question, you need to unmute yourself, and we'd be pleased to hear from Zoom land. Look at your window. Well, well Charlotte. hearing none. Please, take the mic. Hi, wait, wait for the microphone, and then we can do that. Thank you. Uh, my husband, who would probably sit here and talk to you for hours, too, said uh, <laughs> he was wondering if there was a single factor or turning point that caused the enrollment to surge during the 2000s. Uh, I think a number of, a number of things. I think, uh, which is usually the case, you have to get out and tell the story. If you're not... Um, what did Larry Martin, Larry Martindale say the other day? The price is set at the door. So if, if, you, if you have a good product, then the world will find you. And uh, I knew Ole Miss had a rock solid product. I knew we had great people. I knew we had a lovely campus. And I knew we had a lot of spirit and so much loyalty among our alumni group that when I became chancellor, I thought this is a matter of putting together a great leadership team and letting them lead and then involving as many people as we can and you do your part. And Andy Mullins and I covered the state. How many visits we make, Andy? More than and I'm saying that was the whole thing, but the high schools had never seen an old Miss person. Well, they saw old Miss people when Andy and I were out around. And we had a wonderful group of uh, people who recruited students. Uh, Whitman Smith and some others, uh, 
And so a lot of students came here and, and wanted to stay. And a lot have come back to live in Oxford because it's such a wonderful community. Uh, so I think that's what did it. I think the faculty bought into it, staff bought into it, the alumni bought in, and our students did. And we sent out the message. And we tried to do things that would attract attention, like seeking a chapter Phi Beta Kappa. I mean, that's the reason we did that. And I announced that we were going to do that when I had my little inauguration speech. And Gloria Kellum, when I sat down, she said something really classic that I can't repeat in mixed company, but I thought I'd lost my mind, is what she said. You can't be announcing that you're going to do that. I said, I am, we were going to do it, Gloria. And what we're going to do is I'm going to go to Washington and see Mr. Ford and ask him, what do we have to do? And I did. And he told me, just like this building we're sitting in, Overby Center. I went to Cocoa Beach, Florida, and saw Mr. Newharth, who was Charles's wonderful uh, colleague in business for a lot of years, and they both had great respect for each other. And I, I, I show up at this gazebo in his backyard overlooking the ocean with an Underwood typewriter, manual typewriter. And, uh, and he says, well, you've been, you're late, you've, it, it took you long enough to get here. He said, I said, well, I've had other things I had to do, but I'm here. He said, well, how much money do you want? And what for? And I said something. He said, you're not asking for enough. <laughs> I said, I wanna, uh, we want to honor Charles Overby, and we want to put together a center that complements our school of journalism, or our department of journalism, now school of journalism. He said, that's a good idea, and we will do X, and he did it. And here it is, and uh, the programs have been great, and Curtis has been great. Uh, it's, it's been a wonderful well, we're here. We're here because of you in right, so no, many different it, well, ways. I had to overcome you saying you didn't want to do it, you, didn't, you know, but we did it, and so we all did it together. I got to tell you all one, one other story you'll like. So you may recall some of you older people, uh, older than, than students. Um, we got into this discussion about the Confederate flag uh, one year, soon after I became chancellor. And, and I mean, all Hades broke out. And I was getting all kind of nasty mail and nasty calls and complimentary mail and complimentary call, calls. And we were working on it, trying to get it done. Because I'd learned at 580 Kappa that we weren't going to get a chapter of 580 Kappa as long as we wave the Confederate flag. I mean, that, that was just going to be it. So I knew something had to happen, and we started working on it. And I got a letter one day from a man who lived in Starville, who I didn't know, and it had a box with it. And I opened it, and it was pink ladies satin underwear. And he says, dear coward, I think this would fit you. <laughs> Go to the devil and whatever else. So I just took it put it over next to my desk in the, in the last end, and I wrote him a handwritten note. I said, Dear John, thank you so much for your interest in Ole Miss and for your kind letter. I'm delighted to have the apparel you sent to me, and I can't wait to see if it fits. <laughs> your friend, Robert. <laughs> I sent it back to him. I never heard from him again, but nine months later, the flag fight was over, and we didn't, we didn't Somebody came up with the idea of not having sticks in the stadium because they were dangerous. So we did that and the flags went away. That's the only place it was a big problem. Except there are people, white and black, I might add, who never did like the idea of waving, having Confederate flags. So uh, I wrote him another letter. And I said, dear John, I have tried for nine months to wear these clothes you sent me and they don't fit. Maybe they will fit you. I'm sending them back. <laughs> Your friend Robert. <laughs> I never heard from him that time either. <laughs> that brought me great pleasure. Some of. So. You know, this has been such a special evening to be able to talk with Robert, relive great memories, and just enjoy the friendship that we all have and appreciation we all have for well, you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for joining and us me tonight. For you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And we thank all of you for joining us tonight. Yeah, we uh, do. A couple of things. One, in two weeks, we're going to have another program that uh, celebrates the excellence of two people, uh, William and Elise Winter, who have died in the last year. David Cruz, who is here and was great friends with the Winters, is going to lead the discussion. Uh, and it'll be uh, equally, uh, I believe, uh, inspiring. Uh, we have a reception out here a uh, afterwards, free food, free drink, and an opportunity to continue this conversation. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming.